Before we dive into this video, I have to give a quick announcement. Our good friends over at GuidePoint Security are hosting yet another Capture the Flag competition. Now, I have sung the praises of GuidePoint Security and their CTFs in the past, and I will gladly do so again. Coming up super soon, this month, Tuesday, June 22nd at 8 a.m. Eastern Time, GuidePoint Security is hosting a CTF for intermediate players. The description here is that, hey, mid-level challenges are in included that might be decrypting codes with brute forcing, discovering and exploiting vulnerabilities, gaining access into network devices or becoming the super user, the root admin, tons of cool stuff. Whether you are an intermediate player or if you're just a beginner, you're a newcomer, I really recommend and super encourage you go check it out. The whole point is to learn. The whole point is to have fun. But if you're a winner, the first person who completes the CTF with the fastest time, scores the most points, the first place victor wins an $100 gift card. Now it's totally free, all online, and you can register right now. I have a link in the description and I'll be showcasing it on the screen here. Enter your name, enter whatever information you need to so you can click that register now button and you'll be greeted with an email that will give you VPN access and all the information you need so you can enter the environment when it's game time on June 22nd at 8 a.m. The game will run until Monday, June 28th, 5 p.m. Eastern time, so plenty of time. Take a look, have some fun, solve some challenges, and learn a lot. I'm super excited for it. I hope to see you on the scoreboard. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another YouTube video. This is kind of off the cuff. This is totally random and spontaneous. I kind of just got this pass to me, and I thought, you know what? I got a little bit of time. Uh, maybe I can squeeze in a video recording. So uh, hopefully we'll have some fun, but this is just diving in, cold feet. Uh, I don't know what I'm up against, so here we go. We are checking out this directory here. I have a folder named PowerShell, and I'm going to list out the files in this directory. Now, I haven't collected all the files. And I don't know if I will need to get more, but I figure maybe this is a fine enough start that we can get moving. So what we're looking at is a command that started some weirdness, started some badness, started some potential malware running on a computer, running on a host. And it starts off you know, a little PowerShell call. So it goes ahead and reaches out to the PowerShell path, uh, invokes PowerShell with window style hidden and the nice meme case, right? <laughs> random capital letters, random lowercase letters just to kind of evade antivirus or not get caught by stupid, easy, bad, uh, static signatures of just using, hey, one specific case. Uh, and execution profile or EP set to bypass. So we're not going to worry about the execution policy. Sorry, uh, that EP should not be execution profile. It should be execution policy. I misspoke. Uh, and, and you know, when you when you end up trying to write PowerShell on your own computer and you say, oh, uh, it, it, it errors. Running scripts is disabled on the system. It turns out you have to set the execution policy to something other than restricted. You can do remote signed. You can do unrestricted. Uh, there are some other ones, I believe. But by Pass totally doesn't care. It's just, you know what? Uh, stuff is off the wall here. So bypass will totally ignore the execution policy. Then we end up running this script, which is a weird folder out of a, another meme case, Microsoft directory random name with a long verbose file name here that ends in a PowerShell script, .ps1. It ends in that file extension for a PowerShell script. So Spooky. This is a startup file. Uh, this was originally a, a auto run that was a shortcut, a .lnk file that would kickstart this um, inside of a, like startup directories, startup folders. So persistence for potential malware. Let's go take a look at what this big long boy in this PowerShell code might be. I do have that saved in this directory here. So let's go ahead and take a gander. <laughs> And it's a long one. I don't know if you can see my horizontal scroll bar down there, but I'll turn on word wrap and we'll see what we're up against, which is that nice. <laughs> okay. Um, so oftentimes I will try to go through and like beautify or kind of clean this up or format it in a way that I can actually make sense of it. I haven't found, and maybe you know, so please do let me know in the comments if you, if you got something, uh, I haven't found a good sane PowerShell beautifier. Like I see stuff for Visual Basic Script, I see stuff for JScript or JavaScript or anything else, um, but 
I can't track down anything online, and maybe I'm just not Googling hard enough, <laughs> but uh, I haven't been able to find one. I think I found like one, it's like the edit DTW Beautify script, um, but that will work only locally. It's a, it's a PowerShell script that you're supposed to run on your own PowerShell scripts, uh, and it seems to only like function within Windows. Uh, at least I don't think I've been able to get it set up in Linux. And again, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm just not doing it the way that I should. But in the meantime, sounds like we're going to have to clean this up, beautify it, format it on our own. So I'm going to turn word wrap back off. Uh, and I'm going to replace every semicolon, which might indicate the end of a statement, uh, with a semicolon with a new line attached to it. So now we'll have multiple lines. Uh, now, if I were to jump all the way back to the very, very beginning of this code here, we have something that is a little bit more readable. Uh, this big, long thing is seemingly base64. I think I can, I think you might be able to see it at the very, very top here. Lots of random letters, lots of random numbers every now and again, and it has an ending of an equal sign, which could be used for padding. So sure, that's a quick telltale that this is base64. Let's call that variable, and it looks like all the variables are like some big long hash. So that's kind of nice and convenient for us because we won't accidentally clobber variables if we were to try and rename them based off of their name alone with some simple find and replace. And I like to do that. You probably see me do that in, in other videos. So we'll call that uh, blob of base 64, you know? I don't think I could have said it any better. <laughs> I don't know if you could have, but uh, okay. We, have, we do another one from a longer string of base 64. Uh, okay. But that is already decoded. You can see the system convert from base64 call there. So this guy should be called decoded base64. Good. Uh, and looks like then we get started with a for loop, which our simple check for semicolons totally butchered. Uh, so let's clean that up because those semicolons are necessary to kind of define the upper and lower limits of the loop. Uh, so there we go. Looks like this 83441 is going to be our iterator. So we'll just call that i, I suppose. If i is less than the length of the count, is it supposed to increment that? I guess it just does it in the inner loop, which is weird. Uh, and then we have another iterator. So we'll call that j. Oh gosh, I forgot the a at the very front of it. We'll call that J. There we go. Well, J is less than the length of the blob of base64, we increment. So the decoded base64 is indexed, and it takes the current character at that decoded base64 and XORs it with the blob of base64 input. Okay. And then we have an if statement that is still inside of this for loop here. Oh, okay, but then we close it all. And then we go ahead and load a, an assembly. Nice. So we know that this ending, this resulting base64 is gonna end up being a assembly for us. Cool. So then we interact with whatever we end up loading from that .NET assembly. So rather than actually doing this, let's go ahead and simply display that out. So I think I can like write host in, in PowerShell. Decoded base 64 is what ends up being modified. So now that this is nerfed and it doesn't actually end up doing it or evaluating or detonating any more malware, we should be safe and totally okay to run this. And that's what I like to do, honestly. Maybe I'm crazy, but I like to go ahead and use the same language or whatever was actually used to kind of invoke some original code here. Uh, and then I would try, we don't need to make it interactive. Uh, I would try to just let it decode itself. So the script is called QXE that thing. And we'll write out all of this nonsense, <laughs> which are the characters of this file. Uh, I would like to decode that into actual bytes. I'm sure there's a way to do it in Python, uh, w within PowerShell, but I might just like cheat and do it in Python, <laughs> or I could just literally do it in CyberChef. That might just be easiest. Let's let's do that. Um, T stage two or something dot bytes. Yep. Uh, so if I were to have this guy, now let's open up a quick little CyberChef, please. 
the from co from care code is super quick and easy. So let's slap that in from character code. Yep. Spaces, it's going to be base 10. Make sure we set that so it's actually going to operate in decimal, not hexadecimal by default. Uh, and then we can go ahead and save this. So that is currently called download.dat. Let's bring it back to our terminal and let's move from my downloads directory that download.bat into stage two dot DLL, we can assume maybe. Yeah, 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 DLL. Uh, I've recently started to use TRID, um, which if you haven't heard of is kind of nice. The, 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 uh, I'll Google it, TRID Remnux, there we go. Uh, TRID, it, I've been trying to get myself to actually use Remnux more or like actually have a distribution set for some of this anal analysis because I'm, I'm kicking it into Ubuntu right now, which I know is like functional, but it would be better to get a little bit more exposure to better tools, actually get an idea of like Yara, etc., cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so if you haven't explored through, um, Remnux and some of the tools that it has, you should totally check this out. Uh, hopefully in later videos, I'll be sure to go ahead and actually be using Remnux for my own analysis or like the Flare VM if I'm on Windows or stuff like that. So uh, I'm, I'm a baby. I'm a poor man. I'm a plebe and peasant living in Ubuntu right now. But really, I should be hanging out with the cool kids <laughs> in Remnux. So hopefully I can switch to that super soon. I think I literally have a VM for it. Like check this out. Yeah. I got, I got my Remnux guy here, but I just haven't made the switch to like use it much. It's it's aborted right now. Uh, yeah. I like the name that Hash is in here. Uh, B on Twitter. He's a cool guy. So kudos and credit to him. He, he's getting a, lot of, getting a lot of good reputation with that. What am I doing? Uh, I was showcasing Trid. Dear God. Can I actually install this on Ubuntu really easily? Download Linux. Maybe I have it, oh gosh, there's my Tor browser. <laughs> Do I have it cloned? No? Give me that, please. Let's move, downloads, trid, to opt. Yeah? Okay, so now let's go into opt in a little subshell. It is a zip file that I just downloaded, right? Yeah. So, oh, it just put it here. Opt trid, trid. I have to mark it executable. Ta-da! I am an idiot. There we go. Oh gosh, probably needs to have some libraries. You know what? You know what? You know what? Let's start up this Remnox, <laughs> if just to show you. Uh, actually, that that's a lost cause. Uh, I can do that in a later video if need be, but honestly, trid is just kind of neat and that it will look to see, hey, if, if, it, if it's given a binary file, it'll try and analyze based off of a given like growing database of known definitions and signatures, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like a smarter file if the file command wasn't smart to begin with. Uh, it's even better. And we'll give you like, oh, this is kind of what we see in that file. So be sure to check that out. Uh, obviously super simple. Like it's the equivalent of your file command, but so much better and might be helpful. So take a look, check it out. Literally just scroll. Th I, I, <laughs> I like to say like light casual bathroom reading when you're just scrolling through the tools that come with a cool distribution like Remnux. So seriously, check it out. You'll find some really good stuff between Speakeasy, um, other things. Just seriously explore what they have in here and uh discover the the discover this the tools section is super good to offer some kind of neat things you could you could get familiar with uh and if you're using remnux which you should be and i should be you'll have that already kind of set for you all right that's enough of that extremely long tangent for no reason <laughs> We know that we are up against this stage two DLL, which is a .NET assembly and something that we can interact with with ILSpy. So let's fire up ILSpy and see what we're working with here. I already have a lot of uh, <laughs> assemblies kind of loaded in, so forgive me over on the, on the left-hand side. Uh, I will make this text larger so you can see it. The display here should be up to like Let's go 20, how about that? I think that's okay for your eyes, yeah. And this is what we're looking at. Not a whole lot in that original header to tell me what this is. Um, no definitions of what the program is, etc. 
But references, looks like we're pulling in from MS Core Lib and System. The minus module, I've never actually seen anything particularly interesting come from that in IL Spy. Uh, so I'm going to ignore that. <laughs> we do have Mars, though, which is that class or namespace that was referred to in our original malware stager here. This um, loaded the base 64, ran, ran Mars and the Demos class, I suppose, and Interact. So what do we got in here? Here's the Demos class. Uh, taking a while to decompile. <laughs> and okay, this is, the, this is the boy. Here he is. Who is him? App version is new RB4. That is a strange string that you don't often see. Um, asymmetric key looks like a giant RSA key value. Maybe that's used for some connecting to certificates. Ooh! <laughs> Our configuration looks like a little uh, destination address to a spooky IP address. Let's um, let's see where that's going. Uh, let's start up. You know what? Actually, I was gonna I was gonna kick off my VPN, which realistically I should have anyway if I'm just exploring with malware. So whatever. Um, Let's go check out Shodan and see what is in the mix with that guy, with that IP address, if my internet will allow me. Thank you. What you got? 37122471991. What's uh what are you hanging on your window there? What what decal do you have on your doorstep? Mmm. Those locations. And a <laughs> apparently currently live web service without hosting a index.html or index.php. So no index page. But that's that's over there. <laughs> okay, let's uh, get back to it here. Um, if that actually does have a port 80 running, can I can I check with it? Can I can I interact with it? Nothing coming back to me, but it didn't like time out or anything. It connected. Oh, no, no, it is getting a 404 not found. Huh. Would it like a, any index pages exist? No? I mean, that's obviously just going to try those already by default curl, but you could, um, do some like go buster or der buster or kind of look at pages. Um, I, I have heard conversations surrounding that where people are like, hey, running a go buster scan, running a der buster scan is not illegal. And I don't know if that's right. So as soon as I say that, as soon as those words come out of my mouth, I want to immediately add the disclaimer and retract that. Like, I don't know. <laughs> Personally, I wouldn't do it. If it were me, I wouldn't run a massive uh, directory brute forcer against an IP address or domain that I don't own. Because uh, that that just sounds bad. <laughs> just me. Uh, scrolling through a lot of stuff here back in IL Spy. Looks like we have some definitions of J tokens. J parser. Are these meant to be like JWTs? Like... The JSON web tokens? For real? Oh, I should run D4 dot on this, by the way, just in case this A is actually uh, obfuscated whatsoever. Let me do that. I'll, I'll do it on stage two. Um, I don't know if it even found any obfuscation because it was just simply that namespace and that class and that function. Uh, let's open it up anyway. We still have ILSpy open, so let's just go back and check out if stage two cleaned is any different but i kind of doubt it nope still still have mars still have demos or dimos uh all of this is readable there's our ip address still again d4 dot is kind of just a good thing that to to do to see if you can deobfuscate anything inside of your dotnet assemblies or anything that you might be able to dig out if a dll or exe file is still something that is an assembly and you can open up with dn spy or il spy or other utilities uh, I like to use D4 dot. 
JSON. Where is this interact function though? Get work group, mm. get computer name, environment variables, get username, windows identity, get current hex to string, convenience function is 64. Oh, that's checking the architecture, determining the operating system name, neato benito. Checking if it's an admin, generating a random string. I wonder if they're gonna end up using that to like force its own uh, persistence. User profile app data roaming raw string solar marker dot dat. What? What? WTF? Solar marker dot dat? AES encrypt, generate IV. Okay, so we have some functionality to work with AES, both encrypt and decrypt it. We have a handshake function that does some XML things with our AES functionality. Is there anything that's spooky in there? Not really. Uh, do request with our address and the data. We would send a post request Ooh, with the timeout. And is that it? What other useful information is there? Web request, get response. I say that unknowingly, like, oh, the code's right in front of you, John. You should know if you were to read it. <laughs> yeah, I know. Copy to buffer. Oh. Oh, this is with the legitimate memory stream. So it takes whatever is returned from the web page and just loads it into memory to run? Am I uh, misunderstanding that? <laughs> A secure request with AES. <laughs> secure request, raw. Suck request. <laughs> I'm assuming this has to be success request, but oh no, 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 take me back. I didn't mean it, I didn't mean it. Where did I go? Am I in, I'm in some like, internal thing out. No, no, I lost my spot. Let me just look for suck request. <laughs> Success request. I'm a professional. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Don't ever, don't ever think that I am. Hardware ID is applied. Task ID is applied. Is success is applied. Protocol version two. Huh. It begins by starting and passing all of that in the text, waiting for a handshake, making sure it can communicate. Work group, DNS protocol version, same thing. Same thing as we kind of saw earlier. And, oh, whoa, wait, what are we checking here? We, while true, we request whatever text we might have which comes from our argument, which is super weird in the way that they pass and juggle those variables with text one, text two, text three. We send it, get a response, and check to see if the type is PowerShell. And if it is, then we go ahead and run PowerShell yet again with a PowerShell EP bypass and command that, that's displayed very strangely. I know it's broken up. <laughs> I know the text is concatenated and done in a strange way, but the just the synthesis of those two pieces of the words doesn't work together. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Wait a second. Does it, like, take it as a variable? or a file name and like get the content of that file, remove the file and then IEX the contents, the path. That's gotta be, that's peculiar. EXE does the very, very same, except it is going to actually execute an EXE file. Task ID, task ID, protocol version to config. Oh, 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 it dumps it into temp with the environment variable and then it just starts it. Nice. And then it spawns the success request. Cool, cool, cool. More PowerShell with ASCOM. <laughs> uh, okay. Where's Interact? Did I, did I like 
cruise right on by interact oh no it's right here interact get our configuration get the path which seems to be the same location we saw persistence potentially what is array supposed to be bytes length bytes UTF. oh yeah utf8 based on the configuration hardware id in the app version that's going to be determining what the folder is and it would open it and then begin so if the static interact will run our core interact that's it um so ultimately we have some like remote access trojan right here right the rat portion the command and control here is that that ip address that we found that we found previously uh looks like it's calling back to with post requests or uh seemingly some other get requests maybe uh and other other calls here but it communicates with json and could tell you if you wants to run a ps1 file or a exe file so it could just very well run commands if we were to ever get any text or response out of that um these strings here, how the action is kind of built out, that might be something worthwhile. Yeah, it literally just profiles the whole thing. I don't know if you can see, sorry. Uh, getting the user kind, the work group that it's in, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, that's that. Is there anything else to really dig out of this? Uh, or should we just start our detective work on what this thing might be? B. Uh, rock band songs? I don't want that. That that looked like a peculiar string. So I wanted to Google for that. Can I Google for this IP address? Is there any analysis on that? Other than the list of IP addresses. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. Hmm. Oh, uh, something that might be kind of fun, and I don't, I don't think I've done it in a previous video, uh, is starting this thing up with any run. So uh, I should be able to log in. Yeah. Uh, let's just start a new task. Can I upload a file, please? Um, and it might. Oh no, because it's a DLL. Uh. I would have to kind of reconfigure it to know to run that specific function. Actually, the CMD file would just carve it and extract it out. The original PowerShell file. Let's try that. I mean, it's worth a try, maybe, right? Where is the file prompt? Is it here? Did I just... What is happening, computer? Okay, you're alive. Now Now you're alive. Let's just try this guy. It'll carve out the assembly file. IL Spy still keeps giving me a freaking tooltip for no reason. <laughs> I'm not even on the window. <laughs> let's see if anyone can uh, carve anything out of his. Let's, let's just see. I'm sure it'll be able to like to see and detect all the things. Um, because that's the beauty of anyone. There we go. We kickstarted PowerShell. We ran it. Um, is anything else going to happen? Are we still connecting? I see this, I see this bar loading right here and I'm part of me is wondering if there's anything else going on. Oh no, it needed to stink and run it. I'm an idiot. No, 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 no. It did run it. Yeah. So... I want to wait for this progress bar to, for some reason, get there, and then we'll call it, because I've expected this to actually export the thing out. But I guess it didn't. Oh! Is that just like the timer for the analysis? I guess so. What the F? That didn't get anything. <laughs> what, what, what is wrong? Trade is still whining. 
Um, oh, it's because I cleaned it and never had it. I never had saved it when it would actually run it. <laughs> oh, I didn't have the original. Let's do it again. <laughs> Let's do it one more time. Stay with me, everybody. <laughs> yeah, man, that's fine. Thanks for hanging out. I uh, appreciate you sticking with us. We'll do some detective work in a little bit to go uh, track this down, but it might be kind of interesting to see what any run would, would see uh, doing some live analysis on this. Because I could do some live analysis. I could pop this into Windows. Um, we could just do cheeky stuff between sys internals or um, et cetera. There we go. Now it looks like we actually ran something. We loaded that assembly. It it did do write host still because <laughs> I had saved that with that in it. Uh, so the whole assembly is displayed out on the screen. But it is still running according to that little animation over there, which means that interact from the assembly is still actually executing. Um, I'm waiting to see if once this ends, there will be... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It ran SolarMarker. It got SolarMarker.dat. Oh, I want to check out what SolarMarker.dat is. It's a file modification, though. Gives me the contents. Drop from the process. And it ran TRID. Nice. It won't able to be able to detect it because it's a text file. But it's that as the contents. I'll zoom in on that. Exciting. I'm sure that's used for something. But uh, we could download that if we wanted to. What else is happening here? Yep. Yep. Infected password. On the archive, thank you. Um, did not see any network requests, though. Is... What is happening? Oh, 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 I'm scrolling through uh, the timestamps here as to when things happened. Because I moved it. <laughs> but it's not going to end up showcasing the assembly that ran because... It's in memory, right? When it loads it like that. That's still going to end up running or touching disk, I thought. But whatever. I forgot about solar marker. Is that something we can use to track this thing down? Mm, let's go to Google, actually. SolarMarker.dat, yellow cockatoo. Something that Red Canary's got. Yeah, yeah. Yellow, co oh, this is December of 2020. Yellow cockatoo, search engine redirects, in memory re remote access Trojan. That's correct. And more. Uh, Red Canary Intel detected a cluster of malicious activity using a .NET rat across multiple industries. Yep, yep. Yellow Cockatoo is a name. Let me zoom in on this so you can see this. Dear goodness, Red Canary, your website is not all that intuitive for zooming. <laughs> uh, other than a tweet from June referencing a related PowerShell script, Yellow Cockatoo mostly evaded public notice until November when Morphosec published a detailed overview of the threat they called the Jupiter Info Stealer. Jupiter Info Stealer overlaps with the threat we call Yellow Cockatoo, and we'll explain how later in this post. Okay, so any run is some pulling something there, and their decompile doesn't have much going on. Weird strings though. Jupiter Info Stealer. What are we looking at? PowerShell Intermediate Loader. 
An infos dealer is a trojan designed to gather and infiltrate private and sensitive information. Large variety of infos dealers active in the wild. Some are independent. Some act as a modular part of a larger task, such as a bank banking trojan or a rat. Yeah, I mean, realistically, I guess when I say this is a rat, it's not like going to give you a screenshot access or uh, turn on the camera or, uh, you know, activate the microphone, all the spooky, shady stuff. But... Jupiter is an info studio that primarily targets Chrome and, and those things. I didn't see that, but it did allow execution of PowerShell scripts and commands. Um, yeah. What does it do? That loop kind of looks familiar. that for and for and XOR based off of something and then a base 64. Oh, no, 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 no. This next one looks, I mean, the naming of the variable scheme looks very, very similar. See, just a random hash for everything. Oh, these uh like json strings though definitely look familiar yeah yeah get computer name get username id and hwid msinfo32.dxe i didn't see that for process hollowing i didn't see that but the json looks very very similar Scrolling through, sorry. Yep, get hardware ID and it puts in the user profile app data roaming solarmarker.dat. The UID is saved there. So the UID from what we saw, at least in the any run sandbox, I think that would have been specific to the sandbox, but hey, the loader config has uh, the IP address that it might end up reaching out to. XOR key and the version, which we saw, but our app ver, I think, I think that's what it was called. Yeah, app ver was new RB4. Is that something that we'd ever seen? Our, Remnux, what are you doing? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to start you earlier. <laughs> I'll spy, stop with the tooltip, buddy. Protocol version one. Oh. We saw protocol version two. Is that protocol referring to like how they are going to process its server side? With the new key, it indicates admin or user. Yep, yep. Okay, so this is totally it. This is totally like a new variation re re respectfully to that app ver variable with the new RB4. Um, it, it's a later rendition of Jupyter Malware or the Jupyter Info Stealer. What though, oh yeah, here's the, this, this is the same PowerShell intermediate loader that we saw. That's for sure. BXOR, base 64 just above it and the session convert from above, totally. Yep, yep. Do they have a, uh, oh, is there a note of this version 3 one? No. This, okay, this is where it's going to end up stealing, like, passwords and things and cookies, it looks like. <laughs> and that was the page that we had seen kind of on, oh, is that the IP address that it could call that back out to? Does it include that there? Is slash login a thing? Oh. Oh, what about the IP address though? Let me see. Let me see if chat login is a thing. No. Nothing. Nothing for me. Um, unless we need to supply it like a. A variable. No. Dang. Next percent two F J percent two F. Oh God. 
percent to FJ percent to F. No, nothing, nothing for me. But that's the admin panel, supposedly. Yeah. So it's been changing. Some strings that they've seen previously back in 2020 had DR, DRDN for the version, but we're looking at new RB4. Um, is our C2 server in there? RC2 is 3712247, and that is not in their indicators of compromise list. All right, what about the Red Canary Yellow Cockatoo article? Let me move that tooltip one more time. Yeah, why do we give this a different name? <laughs> you may be wondering why. Because it has to be named after a color and a bird, like Red Canary. I'm just kidding. No hate. I love you guys. <laughs> you guys do fantastic stuff. I just... I. Sapphire pigeon, yellow cockadoo. I know. I, I I caught on to the trend. <laughs> what do they showcase? Base sixty four obfuscation, XOR obfuscation, PowerShell writing startup shortcuts, and uh, assembly loading. Yes, all of those things are what we've seen. Hmm. Users redacted dot text. Oh God. Why didn't you clean that? <laughs> so yes, that is something you can easily detect, right? Between base 64 and the XOR there. And that's kind of how like we trigger off of it. PowerShell running startup files. Yep. All in app data and everything that we've seen before. The exact same style and structure as uh, how it executes things. Same thing we've seen. So what makes this different than, I, I'm, I'm trying to get to the part where there's a distinction between yellow cockatoo and Jupiter. Yeah, yellow cockatoo, <laughs> yellow cockatoo uh, uh, runs solar marker as expected. Their, their C2 server is different. Success I equals encoded command host and ID info. Will it? Will it ever, uh, how did our success request come back? How is that sent though? It just returns the JSON data in that function, but text two is built. And then after it would run a command, Nothing else. Nothing else. Okay. Okay, I guess. Yep. All the things it would retrieve. I didn't see MS info in my copy. Does it have MS info? No, I read a little control F and don't see it in the .NET. I else buy freaking stop putting tooltips. <laughs> PowerShell downloads and different things. Yeah. Similarities and differences with Jupyter Info Stealer. EXE naming pattern, solarmarker.dat. You guys found it through search engine redirects. Additional IP addresses used for C2. Yes, still not from what I had seen. Ah, DN, DN, FB1. Am I seeing, am I? So I'm seeing mars.demos, which still has the space theme, I guess, between Jupiter, the planet, and the, and the screenshot that it's had seen in that admin panel. Mars. Um, is this new, though? That's what I'm, I'm curious about. We're going to copy all of this and put it into a sublime text window so we aren't dealing with freaking IL spy. <laughs> Mars Demos. Is Demos a thing? Or am I just saying random letters? Demos is the smaller 
and outermost of the two natural satellites of Mars, the other being Phobos. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's kind of neat. Wow, look at some nerd lore there. Mars Deimos of uh, one of the things surrounding Mars. All in the bundled in the Jupiter malware. <laughs> Has that been tracked down before the app version? I, I'm. Uh, or Mars malware now, I guess I have to say, really. Oh, Phobos. Well, Phobos is ransomware, not really. Is there anything what, Mars ransomware? It's not ransomware. November 23, 2020. Is there anything that's this year? Maybe I haven't Googled around enough. Phobos ransomware, completely different. It's ransomware. Mars ransomware, completely different. This is not ransomware. This is a derivative of the Jupiter malware, I have to think. But it's not, I didn't see the info stealer functionality. And maybe I'm dumb. <laughs> hey, I've got to uh, cut this one short, admittedly. Uh, I'm running on a little bit of a time crunch. So, uh, hey, I hope that was fun. I hope you enjoyed, as always, the exploratory process. It's all discovery-based. It's all just inquisitive. It's all just curious, trying to find out, hey, what rabbit hole will lead down what next rabbit hole. Uh, and it's raw. It's me me Googling out on the open internet to see what I'm really looking at, uh, bumping around an IL spy, checking out some other analysis tools, etc. So uh, I hope this has been a fun video. And if you enjoyed this, please do check out some of the other malware analysis ones. Uh, I do have a lot, I guess, now. And a growing, growing list. There will be more. So... All right, that's it. That's enough. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do those YouTube algorithm things. I could uh, really appreciate it if you would like the video. You know, leave a comment. Maybe subscribe. Be super grateful. Hit the bell. All those things that classic YouTubers tell you to do at the end of the video. Uh, I'm not one of them. Except for this cool outro music. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. I'll see you in the next video. <laughs> With the bird, 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 with the bird,